this story is painful to tell and I'm hardly sure where to start, but I'm hoping that sharing it with others will help me cope. It's a long and complicated story, but I'll try to keep it simple. When I was in 7th grade, a new kid came to my school. We'll call him Chris. He was a year older than me and was quiet and awkward, but he shared many of the same interests as my friends and me, so we welcomed him into our little group of outcasts and he and I quickly became close friends. We stayed friends for nearly 10 years and I considered him to be my best friend for most of that time. However, through the years I noticed some things that were off about Chris. He would threaten to end his own life over arguments that really were not a big deal and he hardly made any effort to keep in touch with any of us. But we all liked him so we contacted him often to hang out. I had actually started to develop a crush on him during the summer between 8th and 9th grade, so I texted him and hung out with him any chance I could. Eventually, Chris drifted away from most of our friend group, telling me he didn't like them, and I was the only one who he really bothered to talk to anymore. When he was around 17 years old, Chris was diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. This wasn't a surprise to me, as he had previously told me about how he had drowned a chipmunk just to watch it die, and it actually planned to hurt a girl in 6th grade at his school over some trivial disagreement that I don't recall. He told me how he never really felt that he cared for anyone except me, and that I was his only real friend. You're probably thinking I'm stupid for having continued to talk to Chris, and you're probably right. However, I was deep into the worst depression I had ever experienced in my life. I have schizoaffective disorder, and Chris and I shared every ugly, twisted, dark secret we had ever had with each other. We had experienced everything together, from the family vacation I had invited him to in 8th grade to the substance abuse spiral we both found ourselves in throughout our teenage years. It felt like we were the only ones who understood each other. We both came from abusive households and suffered from severe mental illness, and at this point I even thought I was full-on in love with him. So I constantly tried to rationalize and make up excuses for all the terrible things Chris would do. And he wasn't just terrible to others, he would be nasty to me too. For example, I was once having a panic attack and felt that I was on the verge of seriously harming myself, but when I called him for support, he said something along the lines of, Dude, I don't know what to tell you, but I'm busy right now, okay? And hung up. I should also mention that throughout these years, Chris showed vague, on and off romantic affection for me, and we were even intimate with each other when I was 18 and he was 19. He had a boyfriend at the time, and despite the fact that Chris treated him like garbage, I did feel guilty. But like I said, I was at a very, very low point in my life. The scary part of this story happened only a few weeks later. It was late at night, and Chris and I were walking back to his house from the movie theater in his city. He received a call from his boyfriend, who we'll call Tim. Tim said that he had an argument with his father and wanted to spend the night. It was well known that Tim and I really didn't like each other, but Chris agreed anyway and told me what was going on after he hung up. I was visibly a little upset, but I knew that Tim had nowhere else to go, so I reluctantly said okay. After a few minutes, Chris started to fall behind me a bit. I didn't slow down for him, and... I did look behind me every once in a while because, although he was my friend, I knew that Chris had a violent tendency which always concerned me at least a little bit. He abruptly stopped by a bridge and looked over the water, gesturing for me to come look. I looked but kept my distance because he seemed to be acting kind of odd and I was starting to feel a bit uncomfortable. I knew he always carried a pocket knife and though I wasn't sure if it was just my anxiety acting up, I suspected he had darker intentions than just watching the river flow. When he realized I wasn't coming any closer, he casually stepped away from the fence on the bridge and we walked back to his house. Fast forward about a week. Chris and I were talking to each other on Skype and because the incident still concerned me, I asked him outright, So, I know you thought about hurting other people before. Have you ever thought about hurting me? You can be honest, I don't actually care. I still don't know how he fell for that, it's pretty obvious that I cared. He hesitated before saying, yeah, and he avoided looking at the screen. When? The other day. Was it when we were standing by the bridge? 
Yeah. He started to pick at his fingernails. What, what were you going to do? This is mostly just morbid curiosity on my part. He finally looked up as he said, I was going to come up behind you and slit your throat and push you into the river. After some awkward silence, the conversation steered in a different direction and I pretended to act normal and calm while we spent the night talking as we normally would. However, for the next few months, I was a wreck. I knew what he had said and done was unbelievably wrong, but he was my best friend. I couldn't bring myself to pull away from him. Looking back, I now know that it was so difficult to leave him partially due to my own illnesses and insecurities, but also partially due to his manipulation. In May 2018, the day before my birthday, I finally cut ties with him. I had been avoiding contact with him for about a week prior and he noticed. He texted me asking what was wrong and after a series of long texts back and forth in which I explained why I was done with him, he just begged for my forgiveness repeatedly trying to say how much he cared about me. The conversation stopped. It just stopped. Ten years of friendship. Gone. Just like that. I was so distraught that night that I actually attempted to take my own life, but fortunately I survived and almost a year later, I'm almost completely over him. Almost. I still panic when I see anybody with bright red hair, and I still can't bring myself to visit his city unless I absolutely need to. My community college is there and I actually considered transferring schools to lessen my chances of running into him. I haven't seen him in almost a year, but... I'm still afraid that one day I'll see him again. And if there's one thing I know about Chris, it's that he can hold a grudge. My mother is mentally ill. She's diagnosed bipolar and paranoid schizophrenic. That said, she wasn't officially diagnosed until I was 13, which was when the story takes place. Even before this incident, it was clear that she wasn't in her right mind. Her paranoia was religious in nature, and not surprisingly, she was an evangelical Christian. I'm not bashing them, it's just that they can be one of the more extreme versions of Christianity. From all accounts, her illness did not begin until I was five, around the time that she had lost both parents within a month of each other. My parents got divorced when I was nine, and her illness was so clear that they actually gave my dad custody which was unusual as the courts tended to favor the mother back then. After the divorce, she took a turn for the worst. She had a large walk-in closet in her new apartment and she covered the walls and floor to ceiling in scriptures written on construction paper. She called it her prayer closet. We would spend hours in that closet praying. I spent hours locked in that closet as punishment for transgressions, real or imagined. She began to tell me when I was nine years old that the devil had planned to get me pregnant. I think I can best sum up the situation by comparing her behavior to the behavior of the mother in the movie Carrie. Now on to the actual story. Her visitation had been every other weekend and weeknight on the off weekends, but when I was 12 I was legally able to decide whether I wanted to go over there for the visitation or not and I had stopped going for regular visitations. I did still see her occasionally and receive phone calls from her so it wasn't strange when one Friday night, that technically should have been her weekend, she called me up to beg me to come over. I had already told her that I wasn't going to come and visit that weekend. I had made plans to spend the night with a friend. She begged me repeatedly telling me that there was something very important that she needed to talk to me about but I was firm and told her that I had plans with a friend and that I wasn't going to cancel. I said that maybe I would come over the next day, Saturday. She refused to accept no as my answer and I ended up hanging up on her and eventually had to take the phone off the hook because she kept calling back. The next day we received a call from the local hospital telling us, my dad and I, that we were listed as my mother's next of kin and that she had been admitted to the psych ward. She wanted us to go to her apartment to pick up some personal items and bring them to her. I said we would. We arrived at her apartment and found a garbage bag sitting outside her door which was not strange in and of itself. What was a little strange was the picture fragment of me that had apparently fallen out of the bag. 
That was what made me open the bag. My dad and I were shocked to find that the garbage was full of me. Pictures from albums, school papers and projects she saved, things that I had made or brought her. As complicated as my relationship had been with her, I was devastated. We went in the apartment and just stared. It was completely trashed, just a larger version of what the trash bag outside had held. Literally everything that had anything to do with me was destroyed and strewn around her whole apartment. There was nothing to do but collect the requested items and wait to see if the doctor at the hospital could shed any light on this bizarre scene. In the process of gathering her things, I found a more current photo of myself, and it was by far the most disturbing thing about the situation. It was a large school photo, and she had scribble scratched my eyes and mouth out. There was also a large knife stuck in the middle of my chest, pinning the picture to the dresser. It was embedded in the wood. We left, and when we arrived at the hospital, we were called in by her attending psych doctor. He explained that she had been brought in by an ambulance the night before after the police had been called by several neighbors, reporting a woman banging on their door and begging them to help her in the name of Jesus because the devil was going to kill her. When the police arrived, they found her praying hysterically, holding a butcher's knife. She had found some random unlocked car and had locked herself in it. The doctor said that she wasn't making a lot of sense when she had arrived and they had to give her a sedative as well as an antipsychotic. Between what the doctor told us and what my now properly medicated mother told me when I visited with her later, here's what I pieced together. God said that I made a pact with Satan, and if I stole her soul for him, he would have not impregnated me. He told her to perform an exorcism on me. Satan was in my heart, and to release me, she would need to open my heart. But once it was made clear to her that I wasn't coming over that night, an angel had come and instructed her to destroy everything that had anything to do with me. It also told her that in my absence it might be possible to perform the exorcism using a particular picture instead. He told her to destroy the eyes and mouth so that I, and Satan, couldn't see her or speak to her. Then to use the knife to, you guessed it, open my heart. This had made Satan angry and he sent demons to her apartment so she had to run out to find help. I'm glad that in the end the incident did actually lead her to help that she so desperately needed. I am a female, 17 years of age. I'm very petite, weighing about 100 pounds, standing at 5 foot 3. I recently joined my local gym around January of 2019 and have started a routine of when I go to work out. I go every day except Monday around 6pm and stay for an hour or two depending on the day. Anyone who goes to the gym on a regular basis notices others around them and gets familiar with what times and machines others like to work out on. And if a new person comes you usually will notice. My point is that you get used to these people being in the gym with you, whether or not you communicate with them. As a girl who goes to the gym, from my experience, you will get the occasional glance from a weirdo or make awkward eye contact with someone staring at you in the mirror. What all you can do for that is stare back at them dead in the eyes and give the nastiest look of disgust. Now, the time that I go to the gym is about when everyone starts to leave. I am very antisocial and shy, so this works out great for me, or so I had thought. I also figured having some alone time would be nice, and if something were to happen, they have cameras everywhere. Stupid way to think, I know, but knowing that you have to have a keycard to get into the gym and one to get out was somewhat of a comfort, along with the cameras. For this last month of me doing my workouts, I got this weird vibe from this one random guy who we'll call Randy. And like I said, you usually get people looking at you, so it's hard to tell if someone is truly a great threat or just someone being a creep. Either way, both are bad things, but it's difficult to distinguish the two. I told my mom about this Randy guy because my gut was telling me something and I felt I needed some advice. She told me we should tell the manager and have them kick him out. But me, being naive and nice, I didn't want to kick a guy out for just giving me the creeps and I didn't think it was a good argument at the time. 
I started to notice some of the other girls weren't coming as regularly as they would. I brushed this off thinking that they either had work or were out of town. None of my business I know, but it was something to take note of. The staff at my gym leaves around 6.30 and I started to notice that Randy was coming in almost exactly when the manager and staff would leave. I didn't pay too much attention to this, as he could just be a regular person trying to work out at a specific time due to his job or something. Huge mistake. The reason for me trying to rationalize this was because I constantly saw Randy, so I considered him to be one of the regulars. Now this is where the story actually begins. I went to do my daily workout and the manager, let's call her Alyssa, came up and talked to me about some of the other girls who worked out at the same time I did. Apparently these girls filed a complaint about Randy secretly recording them while they worked out. The girls changed their workout schedule due to Randy which explains why I saw less of them. She asked me if I had seen any man holding their phone up to their chest and walking with the camera pointing outwards and I said no but I told Alyssa about how this random man, Randy, was starting to creep me out and she said that she would look into it and keep me updated on the situation, especially since I'm underage. The next day, Alyssa talked to me and said that one of the girls who complained about him pointed him out on their cameras and that she was going to wait for Randy to come into the gym and kick him out. I left that night not knowing what happened because Alyssa was still waiting after I left. I came back to the gym the next Tuesday and Alyssa told me everything that had gone down. She had said that she waited till Randy and his buddy, who we'll call Kyle, came to the gym and were parked outside. Alyssa had a friend who was a sheriff and looked Randy's license plate up and, to both of their surprise, he was a registered offender and had been put on probation. Alyssa then found out that Randy didn't even have a keycard meaning he was not a member at my gym and shouldn't have been using the gym, period. His friend Kyle had a keycard and was letting Randy in and they would work out at the same time and wait for the staff to leave. Alyssa prohibited both men from entering the gym again and kicked them out. The scary thing is, is that I remember being alone in that gym with these two guys very often. They blended in very well and I considered them a normal workout person I saw constantly. I'm still not sure if I was recorded by Randy or Kyle, but, but Alyssa told me that she was going to look through the footage and let me know of any other news such as him recording me not knowing. It's terrifying to think that I got accustomed, you could say, with these guys being at the gym so regularly. I'm so thankful that Alyssa kept me informed on the situation. As terrifying as it is, it just shows you that you should always be aware of what's going on around you and trust your instincts. It also shows to never trust anyone you think you might know. As stupid as it sounds, it's easy to get comfy with people we see every day, even if we don't know them. But who knows what might have happened if I caught Randy and Kyle alone again. Please be careful and cautious at all times. Never judge anyone to be a good or bad person until you know them. You never know who might be out there to hurt you when you least expect it. In late May of 2018, when I was 21, I had been on Tinder for about a month or so and matched with this guy. He had this dark look about him and I was kind of attracted to it. Brown eyes and curly hair. He almost reminded me of a cult leader or something, in a non-weird way. We started chatting about the music that we were into and the way he typed or spoke over text just gave off a weird vibe, I don't know why. So I never replied and unmatched him. Later on, I came back across his profile and decided to give him another chance because I thought maybe I was overreacting. We matched again and ended up hanging out in real life. He couldn't drive, so I picked him up and we went to the park. We sat in my car for hours talking and laughing. He was kind of a jerk, but I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. At the end of the night, he asked me if I could stop off at the KFC drive through and order his food. I thought that was weird, but... I did it anyway because I felt too awkward to say no. A couple of days later, we hung out at his house and just watched movies and stuff. He gave off some red flags, but again, I chose to ignore it for the fear of just being shy or dramatic. He would tell me about his ex-girlfriends and shame them in any way he could and make up lavish stories that I knew were lies. 
He didn't have a job and lived with his parents. He was super into computer programming and Discord, Reddit, live streaming and the like. He'd tell me about his friends online and how some of them are criminals and stuff. I just brushed it off as another story. We hung out a couple of days later at his house again and I didn't know it then but this night would change my life and how I look at people. I always tried to see the best in everyone, mainly focusing on the positive and wanting to help everybody, but now so much more hesitant now. I got to his home and we were watching movies again, talking, and his stories were becoming more wild and unusual. I was getting kind of bored, so we started making out and doing things. I had never gotten physical with anyone before him. After we were done, we were laying down and talking for hours. We talked about our dreams and life stories and I told him about my dreams of moving to California and starting my new life there, a goal I've had my entire life and feel very personal and strongly about it. He told me how stupid I was for wanting to leave our city and move all the way out to the west to pursue my dreams in life. He told me when he was younger, his doctor always told him he was manipulative and had sociopathic tendencies. He got into lots of trouble at school. I was on edge. I didn't like how unsupportive and cruel he was being about it all and how upset he was getting so I got a little emotional and started to put my shoes on and tell him I had to go. He apologized and I ended up staying. We got into our beliefs after that. I am a liberal and a practicing pagan witch. I told him I am finally happy with myself and proud of who I would become. He started to tell me the only reason I practice my craft and politics is to get back at my parents and I don't really believe those things. That I'm uneducated in both and don't think for myself. I'm just doing this to get a rise out of my family, which is not true. He told me that all liberals are evil and believe in white genocide and that if I identified as a liberal then I believe and support that. I disagreed with him and we started to argue. Somehow he got into talking about Hitler and how the Holocaust didn't even happen and the Jews made it up. I asked him if I was a Jew, would he hurt me, and he pretty much said yes. He said the most violently racist things and used horrible slurs. I'm freaking out at this point and wanting to leave. He said that Hitler was misunderstood and that the Jewish leaders made up the whole thing because they wanted more power. That none of the proof of the Holocaust was ever true, and if I ever believed that it happened, I was stupid and ignorant. Every time I tried to defend myself and tell him he was trying to play mind tricks... He would blame me and say I'm trying to manipulate him. I started to cry. I couldn't control my emotions and started to have a panic attack and trying to leave but I stood at his door afraid and wanting to cool things down before I left because I didn't want him to be angry at me for fear of retaliation. I told him I didn't want to leave mad so I sat down and was still crying. He told me he understood I was upset but had to shut up and stop making a scene because he didn't want his parents to wake up that I was being really loud and dramatic. The way he was trying to play my mind was so creepy and I felt so unsafe. I had to get out of there because I really felt like he was about to become violent. I said I was leaving and he told me not to go but I got out of his house as fast as I could. When I got outside it was becoming light out by this time about 6am. I ran to my car and pressed the gas pedal as hard as I could to get out of his street. I drove zigzagged so he couldn't find me if he decided to follow me. I ended up in a strip mall parking lot. I couldn't see anything because I was crying so hard. I couldn't breathe. I called my mom and apologized to her over and over and she helped me calm down and came to pick me up. I was traumatized. He kept texting me, saying how sorry he was and that he didn't mean it. It was because he was tired. He told me to text him as soon as possible. After talking with my mom, I decided just to tell him I was really hurt by the things he said and don't want to go any further in this relationship. He left me alone for about a day or two. I was on vacation with mom and my sister and was just trying to get him out of my head and forgot about what happened, which proved to be extremely hard as I have a panic disorder and severe anxiety. He started texting me again about how sorry he was and after I told him I don't want to be with him, he started blaming me. He sent text after text about how I completely abandoned him after only knowing him for a week and that I gave up on him because I found someone better and ditched him, which was not true, that he 
has no friends and he needs friends and he'll never get better if I don't stay and try to make things work. I was terrified. I was trying to be patient and calm about it. I told him it wasn't that. I'm just not ready for a relationship and it wasn't going to work right now. He wasn't having it so I blocked his number. He texted me from a made up number yelling at me for blocking him and how I can't be an adult and face him. That I was just hooking up with some other guy. I told him I wasn't and blocked him again. He made up a new number and texted me that he's going to run a facial recognition software on my face to make sure I wasn't back on Tinder or another app. Luckily, I deleted all of them the day he went insane on me. There was a lot more, but I blocked out so much over time. I ended up just ignoring him, and he went away like that. I would get triggered and have panic attacks about it for the next few months. Eventually, I ended up mostly forgetting what he looked like and try to repress all the memories of that night and the nights after. I was okay again and even went on a couple of more dates with new people. Until yesterday, March 23rd, 2019, I was watching the news with my mom right before work and a mugshot of him appeared on the screen. Man arrested for terroristic threats on Facebook. Messages sent about wanting to blow up 9,000 good kitties at a school. Asking how many explosives it would take to end them all. I ran up to my steps and broke down. I couldn't breathe and was panicking worse than I have since the night with him almost a year ago. He looked so deranged and different. His mugshot was almost identical to the infamous Charles Manson one. I felt so scared and sick to my stomach. I had to hold back from throwing up. I knew one day I would see him on the news for something. I knew he looked like Charles Manson. I knew I had a bad feeling about him from the beginning and I went along with it, ignoring my intuition. I thought it was over-dramatizing it for months and it wasn't as bad as I thought it was, that maybe in hindsight it wasn't as scary as it was while it was happening. My friends thought I was being overly sensitive, but no. Everything I thought in the beginning was right and I should have trusted my gut. All the memories, guilt, regret, and trauma is back now. Since yesterday, I've been so scared and anxious. I can't get his face out of my mind. I have to keep rereading the article because I can't believe it. I mean, I can. I knew he would get caught for his actions eventually. I just can't believe it happened so soon and for something so insane. I've been thinking about posting my story here since it happened last year, but never thought anyone would understand how chilling it truly was until he got arrested. Guys... Be safe when you online date. If the person seems off, they probably are. Trust your first instinct. So this happened when I was in junior high, around 8th grade I believe. I'm 16 now and this experience still makes my skin shudder. For some background to this story, I went to a fairly large junior high. The kids I went to school with were extremely immature and tended to get into excessive amounts of trouble, just like you'd expect from junior high students. To try and keep the students under control during passing periods, some teachers would monitor the hallways until the late bell would ring after each period. My last period happened to be math. The teacher monitoring the hallways in the part of the school where the cluster of math classrooms were was named Mr. Donaldson. Mr. Donaldson was a severely overweight man in his mid-forties who wore beige khakis and a skin-tight polo shirt every day. He was so fat his eyes were hooded from his forehead fat weighing down on his eyelids. Most everybody was either terrified of Mr. Donaldson or loved him for his loud personality. I, still being extremely insecure and shy in junior high, was very intimidated by him. He was always yelling jokes in the hallways and high-fiving kids as they made their way to class. He sounds friendly, I know, but I was extremely shy. I was a very early bloomer, 5'11", with double D cups already and had a curvy figure. However, I still had some awkward baby fat on my face and waist and had braces that did not suit me at all. Yeah, I wasn't really what you'd consider attractive back then. Being so tall and having hit puberty so young, I stood out from everyone and was extremely awkward. My social anxiety tended to get the best of me when I'd passed Mr. Donaldson in the hallways. 
He'd always greet me and flash me with a smile, and I just flashed a small smile in response and hurried to my class. There were reasons to be scared of this man other than the fact that he had a booming personality. He'd had scandals with students in his classes, specifically students I knew. One of my friends who was in his fourth period told me that while she was doing her homework, Mr. Donaldson gave her a sly smile when walked over to her. She hadn't noticed that while she was working, her bra strap slid down on her shoulder, but he had. When he made his way back into the back of the class from where she was, he hooked his finger under her bra strap, pulled it back up, and chuckled when it slapped against her arm. She was too scared to tell anyone other than me and a few other students about this occurrence. Mr. Donaldson always made inappropriate jokes towards female students too. One time, a wiener was drawn on one of the desk seats and a girl sat down without realizing, and Mr. Donaldson made a, a sick joke which surprisingly never got reported. One day, I was walking to math class and Mr. Donaldson was monitoring the hallways per usual. I felt his stare on me, but when I didn't look at him in the eye, he flagged me down. Wow, you're so tall, he exclaimed. He asked me about my height, to which I responded that I was 5'11". Do you play volleyball? No, basketball. I smiled politely despite feeling uncomfortable. He paused, looked me up and down, and then said lowly, Yeah, I bet you do. You've got nice and long legs that are perfect for something like that. My stomach churned. I laughed awkwardly and then sped walked into my class. That was that. He didn't talk to me for the rest of the year, besides staring at me at times with a look which I couldn't quite read. Fast forward to my sophomore year of high school. Some of my friends whom I'd known since junior high pulled me aside at lunch and were frantically asking me questions. Hey, do you remember Mr. Donaldson from middle school? I shuddered at the thought of that creepy old kook. I told them I did and they were freaking out. They told me he'd been fired and arrested for being caught with inappropriate images of children on his computer and for touching students inappropriately without their consent, all of whom were too scared to report him. A picture even leaked that a student took of him having a rock-hard stiffy during one of his classes and staring at a female student while trying to control himself at his desk. To say that I felt absolutely disgusted was an understatement. When he was arrested, he pled guilty and, in his statement, he had stated that he had pleasured himself to these pictures in his classroom after school because he was too afraid to do it at home in fear of being caught by his wife or daughter. Remembering my encounter with Mr. Donaldson seemed insignificant compared to other unfortunate experience that other girls had to go through with him, but just remembering the way he slyly commented on my legs and the look he gave me it makes my stomach twist in an unsettling way every time. Mr. Donaldson, you sick monster. I hope you rot in jail and never come in contact with a child ever again. I have many stories, but my biggest one would be basically my entire childhood. Forgive me if I seem like I'm rambling at times, there are about eight years of pent-up terror this house ensued on my family and I, and these are just a few stories throughout those years. I am the youngest of three girls, we'll call the oldest sister A and the middle sister B. The house was a seemingly quiet ranch-style home, three bedrooms upstairs and three down. My sisters and I had the rooms upstairs and my parents had the entire basement to themselves, which they enjoyed quite fondly. The house always felt off. For instance, just walking in the door brought on a great feeling of despair, but intensified the further downstairs you went. But I was five or six when we first moved in, so I didn't pay much mind to the fact. You would hear footsteps not only at night, but any time during the day, running coming from up the stairs, but no person to accompany them. Lights turning on and off, items disappearing, the usual hauntly things. The most frequent happening would be the overwhelming feeling of being watched, especially in the bedroom. The feeling became so uncomfortable that my sisters and I would often bathe and accompany each other in the bathroom to not feel so vulnerable. If you had to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, you better hold it, 
or rush, hoping whatever was watching you wouldn't catch you. I became accustomed to not drinking right before bed. My room was my sanctuary, like any growing girl's would be. While laying in bed one night trying to fall asleep, I heard voices coming from the closet. Very distinct children voices echoing from behind the heavy wooden doors. I squeezed my eyes shut and held my breath, hoping that would make them go away. I heard, Shh, she'll hear us. As I bursted my tear-pricked eyes open, there, not even three feet in front of me, stood the apparition of two children, a boy and a girl, wearing clothes obviously not from the 1990s era that this happened in. Their faces shrouded from the shadows of my nightlight and they appeared to stare into my soul. I screamed so loud, my sister came tearing into the door and held me tight. I tried to stammer out what happened but my voice was entirely too shaken to even make sense. From that night on I slept in B's room, too afraid to be alone in there now as well. While B and I were doing chores one day, I was alone in the dreaded bathroom, scrubbing the bathroom when suddenly I felt a strong press on my shoulder and heard several loud pops followed by a sizzling sound. I turned around to gloss over the sink and three light bulbs flickering until they burn out completely. I scrambled to my feet only to be shoved down sharply before B came strolling by to take something to her room. I ran out and proceeded to tell my dad, who in turn scolded me for breaking the lights. As the years progressed, the countless entities made their presence known. So far there were the two children in my room, the old man who watched you bathe, I have never seen him actually, just more felt him, and another one, Tessa. Tessa was a teenage girl who wore a cowboy hat, cut off jeans, and a white buttoned shirt. She had long blonde hair, but always hid her face from me with the brim of her hat. She would only show herself for a brief second for me and hustle back down the stairs in the blink of an eye. I later found out from my mom that the old man kidnapped Tessa and kept her in the crawl space under the stairs until pressure grew too much before ending her life and stuffing her body in the fireplace downstairs. I'm guessing she never showed me her face because it was so badly burned and she didn't want to frighten me but my mom has claimed to see her face several times. We had a friend of my mom's come in who was a self-proclaimed psychic to assess the house. She said it was a portal and there was an abundance of negative energy there. She said there were souls that were trapped in the house as well as some that were simply passing by. She managed to rid the children but Tessa and George, as we called him, stayed. We continued to live in the house until we could no longer bear it and put it up for sale, moving out shortly after. Honestly, I'm surprised we stayed as long as we did. Apparently now a family moved in, who used to be seen outside playing and spending time together, only to succumb to the evils of the house itself. I hope one day to be rich enough to buy the house, just to quickly turn it into a pile of ashes. Although this haunting isn't directly happening to me, I still felt the overwhelming urge to share it. My childhood friend who I'll call Tanya is currently attending school at a very well-known university in the Midwest. This past year she recently rented an apartment not too far from the campus with a roommate who I'll refer to as Reagan. It's a small but homey two-bedroom apartment and quite new. The apartment complex was built within the last five years so there shouldn't have been nothing to preface this type of paranormal behavior. It all began a few months into living there when they would wake up in the morning and the door to their apartment would be wide open. Thinking that one of them just forgot to shut it all the way after coming home late from a party, they thought nothing of it. But it kept happening. They were positive that they were shutting and locking it each night. What they thought was just a strange occurrence turned out to be a full-on poltergeist. The next thing that happened, as cliche as it sounds, was that all the cabinets and drawers in their kitchen would be open. They would come stumbling out of their rooms after hearing banging, only to see some sixth sense stuff in front of them. They regularly began to hear heavy footsteps outside of their rooms and rapid banging on their doors. 
Despite this sounding absolutely terrifying, it gets worse. Tanya and Regan would often talk to each other through the walls, as their rooms were right next to each other. Them both being lazy college kids, it avoided having to get up and walk to the other room. My friend Tanya was out for the night with her boyfriend when she gets a text from her roommate. Hey, thanks so much for understanding why I can't go to that party with you tomorrow night. My friend just replies with a question mark, not knowing what she was talking about. Tanya then gets a call from Reagan. Reagan starts the conversation by sarcastically asking why Tanya is playing dumb. We just talked like five minutes ago about the party. You said it was cool if I didn't go. Tanya was completely unaware of that whole conversation. Five minutes ago, she was out eating pizza with her boyfriend. Tanya explains that she hasn't been home for hours and doesn't know what she's talking about. Reagan began to hyperventilate and cry out, Then who was talking to me through the wall? Apparently the voice had sounded just like my friend Tanya, which is why Reagan wasn't suspicious. I'm not sure if it's common for a spirit to be able to completely copy a person's voice or if they are dealing with something completely different. If anyone knows, please let me know so that I can help them deal with their issue, but... It doesn't stop there. A similar situation happened to Tanya. It was late at night and she was studying in her room. Reagan is a music major and often has to practice her scales at night. Tanya can always hear her humming melodious tunes through the wall. That night, as usual, she heard Reagan humming her scales and thought nothing of it. It always soothed her while she was cramming for her next big test. It wasn't until the singing slowly started to get deeper and deeper until there was absolutely no way that those notes could have been sung by a small 120-pound woman. Impressed, Tanya goes into Regan's room to ask how she was able to hit such a low note. When she opened the door to her room, it was completely empty. Her roommate had been out for the night visiting friends. Tanya said she was so scared she didn't sleep in the apartment for a week. My friend said that these occurrences are so frequent now that they just become a normal thing in her life. She has begun to get less perturbed by the footsteps outside her room and the voices she hears on the other side of the wall. One thing Tanya cannot seem to get used to is that when things will vanish in her apartment, these occurrences frighten her the most. I was confused when she told me this. Why would things go missing scare her so much? She explained to me that it was not something small like keys or jewelry going missing. It was giant lamps, chairs, coffee pots, and mirrors. She told me something that has enough power to make a thing as big as a chair completely vanish and then reappear days later is truly concerning. If it can affect an object as big as that, what is it stopping from physically harming her? My dad's side of the family lives in Cuenavaca, Mexico, while my mom's family lived in California. My friends fell in love from the same Californian high school, got married, and both decided to start a family in the U.S. Shortly after settling in, I was born. Both sides of the family can be clingy, so in order to avoid any dispute about visitation, my parents thought it would be better to visit my father's family every winter and summer vacation. I had no problem with it. I enjoyed spending time with family members, cousins, participating in posadas and other holiday traditions. My younger sister was born when I was seven, but that didn't stop visiting trips. It wasn't until it abruptly stopped when I turned nine. I felt weirded out. I would ask my parents why we couldn't visit each time, but each time they would say various excuses that never made any sense. Your grandma is sick. I say it didn't make sense because Grandma from Mexico would always call to talk to me, see how I was doing, and to persuade my parents to visit her. Obviously, she wasn't sick. I slowly began to give up on repeating my question to get the same answer. It wasn't until I was preparing a trip overseas for summer school that my parents sat me down and told me the truth, the real reason why we stopped visiting. On our last day in Mexico, we usually called a van cab to help with luggage and transport us to the airport in Mexico City. It was quite a drive from Cuenavaca to Mexico City, so I would always stare at the window for a good half hour eventually dozing off. 
According to my parents, things were as usual until a vehicle that was off on the road began to follow them. The cab driver noticed and thought it was just a highway patrol checking to see that there's no suspicious activity. My dad knew something was off. First it was unmarked, kept following at a certain distance, and made the same turns the cab driver was making. Finally, the cab driver had enough and pulled over where he confronted the man following us. But as soon as my dad saw the man's back seat open, he yelled to the cab driver to get back in the van and drive. Thankfully, when he pulled over, he left the car on so no need to restart the van, and we sped off. My mom said I kept slowly waking up during the chase and simply told me the road was bumpy and to go back to sleep as she covered my ears and wrapped me in a blanket with my sister by my side. After reaching just a few hundred meters to Mexico City, the men were no longer behind us. My parents knew if they became hysterical when my sister and I woke up, it would just make the situation highly unnecessary, so they don't speak a word about it. My dad jokingly gave the driver a huge tip and thanked him a million times for that narrow escape. Two days passed after the incident and my mother was watching a television channel and looked in horror at a breaking news headline. A family of five were found dead with machete marks on the same road we took to get to Mexico City, and the two suspects that were in custody were the same two men that tried to chase us. She called my dad immediately and cried softly as my sister and I were playing outside. Since then, they were terrified to go to Mexico. The thought of that just aches my heart of how life can turn for the worse in an instance. I had no clue that that was going on. I only wish that my parents would have reported it to the police, but of how corrupted it was and still is now, it would have been meaningless. For the unfortunate family that lost their lives to those awful men, I am sorry, and I send my condolences to their family. Please be careful out there, not just in Mexico, but in general. Anything can happen, even in daylight. If the cab driver had turned off the engine completely when he pulled over, we wouldn't be here. This happened around five years ago, in the area I grew up in. Back then, I was up to no good, but I have since turned my life around. At the time, I was one of very few people that moved large amounts of pain pills in the city. The rest of the people trying to move these pills had them imported from sketchy people from around the world, so you didn't always get what you paid for, and the strength would vary a lot. I managed to get a hold of real ones from within the country and still in their original packaging. Word quickly got around and I wasn't very well liked since I guess I took business from people. This incident happened on a hot summer's day and I decided to go to the park to relax. Where I lived there was a main road with apartments on both sides. In front of my complex there was a parking lot. To the right of the parking lot was another set of apartments with trees separating that complex from another. I was walking in the wooded area between the two complexes as a shortcut to get to the park. So I'm just walking, minding my own business when I start hearing gunshots. They sounded really close, so I hid behind a huge tree. I didn't really know what was going on, but looking around, I could see the foliage around me move with each gunshot. In retrospect, I guess it's pretty obvious, but hindsight is 2020. I waited for silence and then peeked behind the tree to see what was going on. I managed to get a quick peek of a guy holding a gun, leaning back into his apartment. Change of plans here, I ended up running back to my block as fast as I could when I then slowed down. Pretty bummed out at this point, I really wanted to go to the park. At this point, I'm not sure where to go. Home might have been a good idea, but before I was able to give it much more thought, I saw two guys appear behind me. Feeling a bit uneasy, understandable perhaps, I'm keeping my eye on these guys and just keep walking like I know where I'm going. It was weird. They didn't really talk to each other, and they kind of split up on the walking path still heading towards me. This is when I start to realize that something definitely isn't right. I up my walking pace to test it out. That's when one of them reached for something in his pocket or waistline. I couldn't really tell because I just took off again. 
I still didn't know where to go, but I ended up deciding to go to my childhood friend's apartment, which was on the other end of this area. Her apartment complex had a code which she usually kept me up to date on since we'd hang out a lot, but back then, I'm not sure if it's still like this, but the code changed every few months or so. I finally make it to her apartment and punch in the code. Wrong code. So I try again. Wrong code again. So now I'm panicking because I can't see the guys anymore and I can't get into this stupid building. I called her phone and luckily she was home and buzzed me in. I ran up the stairs and explained the situation when I got inside. We played cards and just hung out till the evening. She offered to walk me home but I declined, it just felt a bit unnecessary to put her at possible risk. I ended up getting home safely. A couple of weeks before this, two people had picked me up and tried to carry me into their car while I was on my way to pick up some food that I had ordered. I have a feeling that they are the same people, but as I was struggling to get away, I couldn't really see the shooter's faces very well, probably from all of the adrenaline. So this literally just happened like 25 minutes ago. It's not really a scary encounter or a scary story, but it's unexplainable, which makes it kind of scary, right? So ironically enough, I was just laying in bed listening to the Let's Read podcast on Spotify. Coincidence, I know. So it was exactly 3am when all of a sudden a huge part of my room lit up, basically a huge flash or something. Normally I would say that's no big deal because there is a road outside my bedroom window where sometimes cars will pass by at some odd hours of the night. But what's weird is the fact that my window is completely blocked off by a curtain which won't even let sunlight shine through. Also, I've checked all possible sources where the light could have come from. My laptop, Xbox, and LED keyboard all aren't capable of producing such a short and bright flash. They were all turned off, by the way. Maybe I'm just overreacting, but the fact that it happened at exactly 3am while I was listening to scary stories is enough to freak me out just a little. Needless to say, tonight I'll be sleeping with the lights on. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, our Let's Read Official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. Join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly, and if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.